Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz Fly. I'm the Marine Conservation Director with the South Carolina Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And welcome to the Southeastern Caribbean Disaster and Resilience Partnerships Annual Meeting. This is session two, What's It Take to Be Resilient? Lessons Learned from Louisiana, New Jersey, and Virginia. And we have a really informative and interesting panel lined up for you today. Um, so just a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to our moderator. Uh, we have three great speakers today who will each be speaking for about 15 minutes. Uh, there'll be a couple of minutes for specific questions directly to them after each presentation. So feel free to type in any questions at that point. Uh, but we'll also have about 20 minutes for facilitated discussion uh, after all three presentations. Um, so again, feel free at that point to chat in questions um, so we can have a great discussion. You should see several items in your little go-to webinar um, menu there on the side. One is the handouts tab. This has the speaker and moderator bios in it. Um, so um, please take a look at those. You see all the great credentials our speakers have today. Uh, there's other handouts as well, including background information on the SCDRP. And then there's also the questions tab. So this is where uh, please type in your questions um, so we can have that great conversation. Um, and I, uh, before we get started again, virtual format's hard, but we want to get to know our audience a little bit if we can. So we're going to launch uh, three really quick polls for you. Um, so Barbara, if you could launch the first one, this um, asking just where you are located. So we could only do five options. So sorry if you're in other state, but we'd love to know where you are. Barbara, if you see the answers coming in, maybe I'll let you close it and show the results when you think it's time. Give me a few more seconds. People are still voting. All right, I'm going to close it and let's see. Okay, so good representation from the Carolinas and Florida. Um, but we do have a lot from other states, so I'm sorry we can't parse that out any further. But um, also, if you ask a question, please write um, maybe your name and where you're from at, when you type the question so we get a sense of where people are as well. Okay, um, Barbara, can you launch the second poll? This um, is asking about your affiliation. So who, who we're speaking to you today, I'd love to get a sense of that. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to close it out here in about 10 seconds, nine, eight. I have a few more votes coming in here. Oh, okay. I'm going to close it, folks. <clears throat> okay. A lot of state local government and a lot of private sector, uh, but really nice representation across all five categories there. Super. Okay, we have one more for you. Um, this gets at the topic of our session this afternoon. Do you have, um, I can't remember the wording for it, but do you have a, a resilience officer or a central office charged with, the, with resilience uh, in your state or municipality or territory? However you want to answer that. Votes are still coming in, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna close it up. Okay, so a lot of 65% yes there, so that's great. Well, um, those of us in states without a Chief Resilience Officer, I know we're really looking forward to the conversation today. 
um, to learn from the three speakers that we have. Um, thanks to the audience for answering those polls. Um, I'll now turn it over to our moderator for this session, Mr. Mark Wilbert. Mark is the Chief Resilience Officer and the Policy Advisor to the Mayor for the City of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, again, you can refer to the bio in our handout. Um, but I know some panelists that are very interested in this session for South Carolina. And uh, so, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Liz. And I also would like to welcome our panelists for today, Charles Sutcliffe the Chief Resilience Officer in the Louisiana Governor's Office, Dave Rosenblatt, the Chief Resilience Officer and Assistant Commissioner for the Climate and Flood Resilience Program in New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and Ann Phillips, the Special Assistant to the Governor for Coastal Adaptation and Protection for the State of Virginia. Their impressive bios are located in the program, as Liz said, and we really are very fortunate to have such a group of accomplished experts who are really making a difference, not only in their states, but in influencing resilience work around the country. As a chief resilience officer in a small city, in a state set to hire our first chief resilience officer, I have to tell you, I'm particularly eager to hear what our panelists have to say about how their offices are structured, what they've been working on, relationships that are making a difference, and what it is and what is not working. There's no doubt in my mind, there's something in here for all of us to learn, and I'm eager to get started. When we get to the question and answers, Kelly will be monitoring the questions that come in, and she'll be reading them when we get to that section. So we're right on time. And first up today will be Charles Sutcliffe, Chief Resilience Officer with the Louisiana's Office of the Governor. In Louisiana, they've been working on some really exciting projects around protecting their coasts and developing a comprehensive coastal master plan. On a trip uh, that some city staff and myself took to the Netherlands about three years ago, we had the good fortune to spend quite a bit of time with uh, officials from the state of Louisiana who ended up traveling with us. And we talked a lot about the good work that's going on in Louisiana. It's exciting now to hear about how it's been progressing under Charles' leadership. Charles, it's yours. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, it's really an honor to be here with uh, panelists like these, and I'm really grateful to be uh, invited to be on this, um, you know, uh, part of your, your overall uh, presentation today, too, as well. So, and then thanks for the introduction to kind of some of Louisiana's work. I think that that is where I'm going to start, is with uh, Louisiana's kind of uh, longer standing coastal, coastal work in the um, protection and restoration space. So if you could go to the next slide. That's how this is working. Yes, great. Thanks. So, so the ultimate context for Louisiana is our coastal crisis, and this crisis stems both from natural and man-made causes, and it's a crisis that um, both predates our current focus on climate change-driven environmental risk and will also be uh, exacerbated by it um, to a great deal. So we have to date loss of around 2,000 square miles of our coastline since the 1930s, and um, modeling suggests that we could lose as much as uh, 4,000 more uh, additional square miles of coastline over the next 50 years. Uh, this land loss, of course, directly translates into increased storm surge vulnerability for more and more of our communities in the southern portion of our state as, as the Gulf of Mexico uh, moves inland and, and threatens, th threatens places and people that weren't maybe previously threatened. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so with this slide, uh, you know, over time, you know, in response to this crisis, Louisiana has built up quite a lot of expertise related to protecting and restoring our coast. Um, as, as Mark mentioned, we have a, a coastal master plan. It's now in its third iteration, and the fourth iteration is due in 2023. Uh, this plan has also provided the foundation for a lot of other adaptation efforts like Louisiana Safe, which was a community-driven holistic planning effort that was done in six coastal parishes, uh, and the Louisiana Watershed Initiative, which is it was, um, a lot newer. Um, it's looking at reforming how we do floodplain management statewide by watersheds and across five different state agencies. Uh, it, would also, it should also be mentioned that Louisiana has its fair share of disaster management expertise uh, that has built up over the years. And so the resilience work that I wanna talk about today um, builds off of these previous adaptation efforts and is intended to fill a different need than the disaster response infrastructure that we do have, but also be integrated into all those things in the long run. So we'll, we'll see if we're able to do that. Um, I should also mention too, that we've recently begun our first uh, 
climate change mitigation work in Louisiana. So we are uh, we have a climate change initiatives task force that is investigating ways to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions um, to be net zero by 2050 with, with uh, near term and medium term goals as well. And that effort too kind of overlaps with some of the resilience work that, that we're leading out of, out of our office. And I'm a shared staff for that effort um, as, as, as it develops. So that's kind of, kind of some of the broader context um, for, for what's happening in Louisiana. If you could go to the next slide. Uh, I think that the last piece of this, uh, I think, is that it's important to note that that we do have a lot of really exciting um, projects happening that we that we're really proud of. So these statistics kind of show the the accomplishments of the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority in Louisiana since its inception in 2007. And so these stats represent 111 completed projects across all 20 of our coastal parishes. And they range from shoreline protection, levee improvements, floodgates, pump stations, uh, and ecosystem restoration projects like marsh creation, barrier island restoration, uh, things like that. Last year, we were projected to spend uh, for the first time a billion dollars out of the CPRA. Um, and that's the level of spending that the master plan always kind of envisioned for the coastal program in Louisiana. I mean, we were excited to kind of meet that mark um, last year and we're hoping for a similar level in the next couple years um, the, the budgets are, are still being prepared for the coming fiscal year and we have to factor in COVID and the economic downturn and things like that but it's still going to be a really a really strong year um, and many of the projects that we've recently commit uh, completed or are in the pipeline uh, restore hundreds or thousands of acres of coastal habitat and have price tags uh, of 100 million, 200 million dollars, and even a billion plus dollars. A lot of that is being funded from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill settlement, but um, nevertheless, it's just the scale of restoration and protection work that we've always needed in the state, and we are finally to that point. Um, next slide, please. Uh, but the reality of the coastal crisis is that no uh, amount of success that we can have to restore our coast uh, will we'll ever get us back to where we were in the 1930s. And then we also are, are more and more sure that the, the current coastline that we have is also not going to be sustainable in perpetuity. So the modeling done for the 2017 Coastal Master Plan um, really was, was, it was, it was the first time we were able to show the full results of implementing uh, the $50 billion um, plan that we have for the state. Um, over 50 years. And so this map is showing us that so while a lot of good can be done, and so there's restoration uh, that is effective and it's in really strategic places where we need it the most, there are still a lot of areas of our coast that are going to experience a tremendous amount of change. And then we're going to have to be able to manage that change uh, for in the years and decades to come. Um, next slide, please. And so I think that's, that's the immediate kind of origin story for my role as Chief Resilience Officer in Louisiana. It really comes out of that, that last map I showed you. It builds on conversations that it started happening before the 2017 Master Plan, but was really made more urgent um, by, by the kind of the picture shown in that, in that last map I showed. Um, in, in 2018, the governor called his entire cabinet together to New Orleans for a two-day retreat focused on the broad implications of the land loss crisis. Um, and uh, it was a retreat, I might add, that was punctuated by Hurricane Michael hitting the Florida Panhandle as a Category 5 storm. And so on one hand, our resilience work um, was almost derailed by a hurricane, as, as I'm sure you guys can all um, relate to. And on the other hand, it really helped refocus everyone on the severity of the task at hand. And I think that was, um, you know, just reinforced this year, we had uh, just an extremely active, uh, extremely devastating hurricane season here. Um, and that's something that, that that's always kind of kind of right there um, uh, in front of us. Um, we had back in 2018 though we had we had really two two full days uh, working on this issue. We were able to talk about the futures for Louisiana that were shown in those maps that we that we might want to see, and we were also able to be really candid about the future of Louisiana that we did not want to see, um, and started crafting some ideas about how to move that forward. Um, the participation among the different state agency heads was really fabulous and engaging, and we heard um, more than a few times about how liberating it was for these high-level officials to be able to kind of take off their day-to-day, -day, you know, um, agency manager hats and focus on being a, a state, a leader for the state on an issue that is so, so long, um, you know, su such a, a proactive, uh, proactively rather than, rather than kind of some of the day-to-day -day emergency uh, putting out that we do. 
Um, so if you go to the next slide. Um, so the retreat was made possible by a local nonprofit group that we work with called the Center for Planning Excellence, or CPEX, and then also some philanthropic sponsors that we were relied on, and they have really become the team for the resilience work that we're now doing. Um, CPEX is a planning organization, and they were able to match state funding with generous support from the Kresge Foundation, the Greater New Orleans Foundation, the Walton Family Foundation, and the Foundation for Louisiana, so that we were able to collaborate on a work plan to build resilience across all of government. And so, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the structure of our whole office, but, you know, there's kind of, there's me, there's the CPEX team, and Denise Reed, who's, who's joined them, um, a coastal scientist that we work with um, really well. Um, and then um, everything else is kind of volunteer uh, and, and kind of, um, you know, unfunded mandate, as they say. Um, next slide, please. So we, we've named our work that we're doing um, the Adapt Adaptive Governance Initiative. We knew we wanted it to live longer than a project and that it wasn't really a program, and so we landed on the word initiative. So we have a couple of big goals that we've uh, kind of given ourselves for this. Uh, and, the, and one is to assist agencies in understanding their relationship to the coastal crisis and to each other. We wanted to develop strategies and tools that aid in the integration of coastal master plan projections into decision making. So all the data that, that fuels the development of the master plan and those, and those maps, the projections of those maps, uh, we, want, we want that integrate that into other state agency decision making. We want to be able to leverage partnerships uh, better so we can maximize investment benefits and then establish a framework for proactive climate adaptive governance for Louisiana. Um, we also really have focused on making building resilience something that is both concrete and actionable. So focusing on the kinds of outcomes that will like tell us and show us that we are becoming more resilient and trying to really try to make that as real as possible. And so we, we really just want agencies to, to know what their role is in this, how they fit into this issue, um, not just from the practical point of view, but also from the, the visionary point of view. I mean, we want to connect them to this really large and extremely significant work of making Louisiana's future more sustainable. And we also want to you know, embed within them the idea that the coast is changing in really fundamental ways and help them anticipate those changes and respond in ways that are meaningful for, for the people in our state. Can we go to the next slide, please? So our work is, is authorized by an executive order from the governor um, that does three things. Um, it creates the, the CRO position within the existing office of the governor for coastal activities and establishes points of contact at every state agency. So we have um, reached, we've also reached into, uh, into the independently elected offices to get their buy-in as well. We've had success there, but it's, this is really um, aimed at the executive uh, branch agencies. Um, these resilience coordinators have been who we work with through all of our, our workshops and our kind of planning and, and, and that have been our partners in this. Um, it then asked the agencies to undertake a vulnerability assessment with respect to the coastal, coastal crisis to uh, identify ad adaptation actions after that, and then incorporate these vulnerabilities and adaptations into their future actions and strategic plans. We don't have any legislation making this permanent, uh, but we are identifying some overarching changes that might need to happen across government that might require legislation in the future. And I think it'll be interesting to hear from our other panelists today about, about some of the things they've been able to accomplish um, in their states. Um, next slide. So happily, we are finally in a stage of this work where some of the tools we've been working on together are starting to be uh, released for use among the agencies. And one of those tools is our framework, which really begins with this inclusive definition of resilience that shows how and where each different type of agency um, across state government can really fit into this, this larger project of, of building resilience. So the, the framework that we've developed is intended to kind of guide agency leadership and staff as they make decisions about their existing and future operations on the coast. It prompts those who provide oversight or management of agency efforts with a series of questions to help them consider um, when, when they can um, you know, see an opportunity to enhance their contribution to coastal resilience. And, and while I'm sure that you know, everyone listening on this call has, has a working definition of resilience that, that recognizes that it's multifaceted, I think this, the development of this tool and this kind of diagram has been a really big step for Louisiana. As I mentioned, we're really building on a very strong coastal protection and restoration program. Um, and that's really set us up extremely well to adapt as a state, but it only really operates within um, two of these four pizza slices. Um, 
the robust built environment is where you know we're building levees and protection features and the sustainable natural environment um, is where the coastal restoration work could be housed but we didn't really have a, a, a really concrete way of drawing in the other two big slices of pie on the screen so the vibrant economic activity or the health and opportunity for all coastal residents we're kind of missing pieces until we were able to broaden the resilience work outside of just CPRA and, and into these other agencies and, and provide this framework to help them see where they fit in. Um, so this has been helpful. You know, we've been able to put a narrative around these different elements of resilience and to pull them all together around a larger vision of what we're really trying to accomplish. And so you can actually skip the next slide and go to the number 12 for me. Thank you. Um, and so the other tool um, that we're almost ready to start using is our vulnerability assessment. The agencies that we work with don't have to use this exact tool that we're building, but we, we want them to, we wanted to provide them with as much assistance and guidance as we could about how, how this could work. Um, and we really hope they use this one. Um, the tool really aims to identify which of their assets and services are most susceptible to coastal hazards and where and when um, the different impacts uh, and consequences where, where they'll kind of reveal themselves. Um, the components, um, the, there are really a lot of components to this. Um, one is just about their exposure, so um, of their assets or their services to both the acute shocks and the chronic stressors associated with coastal change. We want to look at, um, after that, the vulnerability of their facilities or services, so um, how, how vulnerable are they to those, those exposures that they have and then finally, what's the mission significance of that impact? We don't. Um, we want agencies to kind of focus first on where it's most critical for their operations or their their mission, and then um, can go from there. And so, again, we're trying to look at both shocks and stressors that are uh, more chronic. Um, this is not just about hurricanes, but it's about all these slower moving uh, future changes that we know are happening. We are trying to look at both today's vulnerabilities and the future risks and um, look at um, both services um, and, and constituencies as well as, as asset bases, um, which has kind of been one of our, our challenges there. Um, and I think this, this whole process is going to be really, really critical for us um, to develop buy-in amongst the different state agencies to really show them why they need to be involved um, in, in this effort in the long run. And we think it's also a really concrete step that will move us toward more efficient and a data informed investments as a state. And so while we're working, um, we're very close to implementing this tool, we have, um, we've also begun to kind of start thinking about the next, the next arrow at the bottom of that screen. So how do we, how do we, okay, once we, we get them started identifying vulnerabilities, what does the next step look like? How do we want them to start thinking about adaptation options? And we think a lot of those will start to reveal themselves during the vulnerability assessment, um, but we also want to just have that, that is our real big next focus um, as we move forward. And so um, if you go to my last slide, I just wanted to raise a few of the, um, you know, the, the issues that, that have come up as we've kind of gone about this work, and, and they're all just, just questions, and so I hope that's okay, and they can um, be answered by other panelists, and we can talk about it later, but but some of the things that we're, that we're just thinking about, right, so is, is the Chief Resilience Officer um, situated in the right spot within government. So we have um, a particular context to our work that is coastal. We've since also begun to work on climate change mitigation more directly, which is a statewide effort. The watershed initiative I mentioned is another statewide effort. Um, and so uh, there, there are a lot of governance and organizational questions that are arising and we don't yet know what the right answer to that will be. Um, but for now, we, 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 we built this office and this, this kind of initiative, initiative inside the, the existing structures that we had. And so we'll see um, how that holds up towards the, you know, after a, a year or so. Um, another question that, that we've just, you know, constantly dealt with is just how do we institutionalize this, this kind of shift that we're trying to um, do here? Um, we are asking agencies to incorporate these vulnerabilities and adaptation plans into their strategic plans, but is that really the right place to do that? Um, do they do they even use those documents? You know, what are what are the what are the real and, and other important places where planning and decisions are being made, and how can we better institute the resilience lens there? I think that's one of our big questions. Um, and then, how do we influence um, thinking and actions? Um, you know, just further inside the department. So, like I mentioned, we're we're, we're working with resilience coordinators who are, are pretty high level, and that's that's good. We have uh, buy-in from leadership, but when you know, are, are we are we reaching down? further into the departments where um, 
you know, project decisions are happening or other, other types of, of things are happening. Um, so that, that's another big issue. And then another one um, is, are we, are we really developing something that, that works well for agencies that don't have a lot of assets to put towards this? So we, um, we you know, it's, it's a resource question. I think we're trying to get that balance right. You know, we don't want to tell everybody what they have to do. We want to be in partnership with them and work with them and provide as much support as we can, um, knowing that we only have so much time in the day and they too only have so much time in the day. So really, how do we get that balance right? Um, and another another challenge that that we're dealing with is I think it's 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 a lot more straightforward to kind of talk about assets at risk and and building a stronger infrastructure uh, than it is to kind of think about some of the more human dimensions. And I think that's something that we're working on. And then the last thing I would mention is this is just that are we are we focusing on the right things? You know, we've got um, you know there's a disaster coordination piece. There's community capacity building and support that we could be doing. Uh, are we meet, meeting the needs of, of people in, in new ways and the right ways? So I just think there's there there are just a lot of needs, obviously, around Louisiana um, related to this issue. Um, you know, last year's hurricane season and and COVID, you know, notwithstanding. And so you know, we really want to be doing the work that will help the state be better positioned in the future. And so uh, we you know we want to be clear about what we are doing and what we have time to do, but we also are just open to just knowing that there's there's more to be done. So. With that, I'll um, take any questions or turn it back over to Mark. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Charles. And, and I'll first uh, ask if there's any questions in the queue. Not at this time. Okay, great. Well, Charles, uh, great presentation. Let me just start by saying great presentation. Uh, you covered a lot there, right? Years and years and years of work, you covered a lot. Uh, there's one question that I've got that, um, that I've had for quite some time, and you really kind of highlighted it for me. And, and you know, on a recent visit to Baton Rouge, uh, over to the model there, at, I believe it's Louisiana State University, where you show your whole coastline and the work that's going on. But really, my question goes to: in, in Louisiana, you put together, it appears, just a great private, uh, you know, business, nonprofit, education, educational institution, to set up partnerships, right? So, so how important is that to your work? If those partnerships didn't exist, if those big businesses, if those nonprofits weren't there, where do you think you'd go? What would it be different? And how important is it for other states, and maybe those states that are just looking at developing a program like this, to develop those same partnerships, maybe up front, really? I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, um, the partnerships are really what makes this issue so special in Louisiana and makes it so um, durable and uh, nonpartisan. Frankly, we've been able to kind of um, ride a lot of different different trends and waves. You know, kind of stay untouched uh, through a lot of different kinds of transitions that we've had. Mostly because we we are reaching out across the entire spectrum of users. And I would say that that red map that I showed at the very beginning, you know, it's, it's risky to make that map, but it also kind of shows everybody that they have, they have something to lose in this. And so that's from big businesses, uh, you know, small, small community organizations. Um, and so, you know, we really have over time kind of built, built some trust uh, in all those different groups. Um, and you're right. So the state doesn't, um, we, we try to outsource a lot of a lot of this work. You know, we don't own the the marsh buggies and the the, the pipe that we use to move all that dirt at the Coastal Restoration uh, Authority. We we rely on the private sector for a lot of that. A lot of the um, science and engineering is happening at universities in the private sector. We've got the Water Institute of the Gulf that helps try to kind of bridge those those gaps there um, and support us from from the scientific point of view. And then we've just really been really intentional about connecting. Um, some of the, the protection interests and the environmental interests along the way. And that's really kind of brought us um, just a lot of goodwill and a lot of different camps. And so I think we're really lucky and really unique to be able to work um, with a bunch of different groups as we go through this. Yeah, and, and well, thanks, that's, that's great. And like I said, for anybody who hasn't seen it, I'd recommend a, a trip to just see how that's all put together and, and held together. So great job, Charles. Okay, next up is gonna be uh, Dave Rosenblatt, who's the uh, Chief Resilience Officer for the state of New Jersey. Um, Dave and his team have been working on putting lots of plans into place that integrate resilience into the everyday fabric of how work gets done in New Jersey. And uh, I just wanna say, you know, I'm a native from New Jersey and I still spend a fair bit of time down at the Jersey Shore and I get the opportunity to see the great work that the state is doing uh, post Sandy 
to restore those communities that were just devastated down there and prepare for the future. I, I will say that the work is really impressive that the state's doing, and it's something I've been wanting to hear more about. And I think you'll find this uh, Dave's presentation informative. So Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. So first, let me say that um, we have been wrestling with uh, coastal storms, uh, inland flooding for a long time here in New Jersey. And I've been working with the Office of Engineering and Instruction for the past 16 years. And in trying to mitigate the damage from coastal storms and flooding, uh, we were not only participating in resilience, uh, but resilience that was always trying to address the last storm. We were always in recovery mode. In May of 2019, I was asked to take this role as Chief Resilience Officer, of course, with the focus on getting us out of recovery mode and get us into adaptation for climate change. Uh, yes, because we're a coastal uh, state, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, what we're going to do about the, the rising seas. Uh, but uh, and, and I was prepared for that. But I'm not wasn't quite prepared to take on uh, all the other things that climate change is, is going to bring uh, with increasing temperatures, uh, all the community concerns, the health concerns, agriculture concerns. So uh, this has been a real learning experience for me. Uh, it's just started. Uh, you know, starting in 2019, uh, when I was appointed and uh, in November 2019, uh, the Governor, Mur Governor Murphy uh, confirmed my appointment with an executive order 89, where he laid out various tasks for us to complete in a very short time. Uh, the first task was to create an interagency council on, uh, on uh, climate change consisting of 17 state agencies. Uh, then we had to uh, prepare a scientific report on climate change. Uh, then the main, <clears throat> the main products were to be a uh, uh, climate change strategy report and also a coastal resilience plan. So those are the things we're working on right now. Again, moving from constant recovery mode due to storms here in the state, moving into climate change adaptation. And it's interesting, I just saw an article today, uh, President Biden uh, has specifically mentioned, uh, yes, we've been very focused on mitigation, uh, mitigation of greenhouse gases and the impacts they cause. But now he wants to move and turn attention to adaptation also. So I think that's a great national movement uh, that we are participating in. Next slide, please. There you go. <clears throat> Admittedly, we were a little bit late to the game. States like Louisiana, thank you, Charles. Uh, resilient Roading from Rhode Island. Uh, great reports uh, for us to use as models. Uh, we like the engineer work in Louisiana. We like the straightforward simplicity of Resilient Roadie. And uh, we also very much appreciated the, the community approach in the Miami report. Uh, how, how do you how do you sustain the, the, the strong cultural ties that a community has uh, in the face of increasing pressure from climate change? Great reports, all something to learn from each one. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so. In New Jersey, we have we have a luxury of, uh, or excuse me, a wealth of uh, academics here. Uh, we have great colleges. We have Rutgers University, which is now the Climate Center in New Jersey. Uh, we have Princeton and Stevens Institute of Technology and Stockton and Rowan. And I don't want to I don't want to name them all. I don't want to leave them out either. Uh, but we can frequently 
use them uh, to help us in our, in our mission. And one of the first things we did was ask Rutgers to take a look at everything that was going on around, going on around the country and put together a report. Again, didn't have to start from zero. We had some ideas going in as to how we want to tackle this adaptation of climate change. Also from Rutgers, uh, Rutgers had previously formed a science and technical advisory panel uh, to deal with sea level rise. Uh, we asked them to convene again to incorporate the increased uh, ice melt that was being observed and come up with numbers for us to use regarding sea level rise in our planning efforts. Next slide. All right, here you're looking at uh, a, a very important part of, of what we're doing, uh, what we're responding to, sea level rise. In New Jersey, we've decided to use the planning benchmark of the year 2100 and uh, the 5.1 by feet of sea level rise that's going, we expect to occur to that point. Uh, that's what our planning is going to be based on. There's controversy. Uh, there's people that will believe the science uh, that when it spells bad news. Uh, but this is what we're going with. And uh, we, we, we have uh, very strong feelings about uh, its, uh, uh, the projections and the reliability of them. So uh, again, it, it's important to set a goal. And uh, this is what we have. Next slide. Next slide, please. Sorry, Dave, there seems to be a delay. I am advancing it, but it's taken a little bit to show up on all the screens. There we go. All right, so the sea level rise uh, data that we just saw is included in our scientific report on climate change. Again, with all the universities, colleges in the state, uh, we're very fortunate to have some very uh, New Jersey specific uh, science information and data. Um, this is a 200 plus page report produced by 60 uh, staff internally. And um, can I hear? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, I'm getting signs up on my screen that I that you're losing my my audio, but I think you're, I mean, um, you can. Dave. I think your your uh, internet may be a little jumpy. If you want to turn off your video so we can just hear your voice right now, that may may work a little bit better. Screen might advance a little bit better. Okay, how's this? All right, so we again we have this scientific report on climate change. It's very comprehensive. Um, you can look at the chapters, sections down below. We have a, for those, for those who are so in, not inclined to, to go through the entire uh, details of the report, we have a great 10 page executive summary. In fact, I think that's what most people are reading, except for the pure scientists in our department and around the state. Uh, we think this is the basis for everything we do, uh, all the science, all, so that we can start planning based on this. Um, the, this, the first version we have will, of course, be replaced by another in two years as per the executive order. We are already starting to work on this. This was, came out on June 30th. We're working on the second iteration of the report. And uh, we'll put it out at least every two years. But as, as climate science changes so rapidly, we're probably looking at more frequent uh, additions to it. Next slide. Okay, just, just uh, some of the highlights regarding temperature and precipitation. Yes, we expect it to get hotter here. We expect there to be more precipitation. We expect the intensity and frequency of the precipitation uh, to increase. Uh, it makes <laughs> the precip precipitation changes are gonna make our planning for major civil works projects along the coast and in our inland rivers 
uh, a lot more difficult. Uh, a lot more work will go into those, but uh, we're, we're trying to stay on top of this as best possible. Next slide. These are, the to these are the topics that I never expect to have to be familiar with necessarily, but these are part of the science report and therefore will be part of the uh, strategy report that we're preparing now. Next slide. All right. So after we met a couple of times with the Interagency Council of 17 agencies, uh, we decided to take some of the results from the science report out on the road. Of course, we weren't on the road, we were on the web. And uh, we met with 300 people. Uh, some were uh, the general public, some were government practitioners, um, others were experts in the field, and asked them based on uh, our science report, what they knew of it, and what they knew from the press. Uh, what were their feelings on uh, climate resilience, uh, climate change in general? And we got an idea of what the participants preferred as far as actions and strategies. Uh, interesting enough, uh, some uh, there, was, there was a lot of emphasis on nature-based green infrastructure solutions to what we were doing. Uh, there was a call for less emphasis on uh, civil works projects. And I, I mean, you know, hardcore construction, uh, the flood walls, uh, uh, flood gates across inlets. Uh, people in, that were participating, participating were looking for uh, more, more cost-effective uh, means of moving us as a state into the future with ad adaptation. Uh, there was concern that uh, there's way too much risk near the water and coastal areas. So uh, people were questioning, how do we reduce risk going into the future? Uh, so we, we took all this information as we proceeded on with our development of the strategies. Next slide. All right, so this is the heart of, uh, of our efforts here. Uh, both the uh, climate change strategy document and the coastal resilience plan, which is, a, is really a separable part of the uh, climate change strategy report, uh, but we're including it as uh, a chapter. Uh, you can see the subsections here, uh, supporting and sharing the science, building resilient healthy communities, strengthening resilience in New Jersey's ecosystems, promoting coordinated governance, and expanding resilience uh, funding. Next slide. So one of the first strategies or strategy sets that we're looking at, of course, is building resilient and healthy communities. I think to summarize this, you have to say that building correctly and in the right spots is key to this strategy set. What we want to do is integrate climate change into state, county, and regional planning documents and initiatives to help guide local actions. Uh, certainly, we want to uh, provide the state with uh, regulations on how to do these things, how to build, where to build. Um, we want to integrate public health considerations into all our resilience planning policies and projects. Next slide. Strengthening the resilience of New Jersey's ecosystems. Um, Twofold uh, process here. We want to, we want to, of course, protect the e ecosystems for their own intrinsic value uh, to to the state, but we also want to protect uh, ecosystems like wetlands and forests for their flood control uh, value, also for their carbon sequestration value. So uh, this strategy set uh, is, is twofold, twofold approach. Next slide. Promoting coordinated governance. In, in a state with um, over 500 municipalities, uh, 20 plus counties, it's very important for us to make sure that uh, one, we're working as 
in a coordinated fashion as best possible. We're never going to achieve perfection in this. But what we want to do is uh, throughout the state agencies create uh, coordinated resilience action plans. We want to be very transparent with the public and lower levels of government so they can observe and use us as a model for when they do planning. Uh, develop guidance for how to integrate social vulnerability and environmental justice considerations into resilience planning. And again, here we have uh, partnering with our academic, academic institutions to offer resilience planning and design services and demonstration projects. We have found that we can't keep up, we can't keep up with uh, the university's request to participate. Uh, they're, they're ready to go. And we're just, you know, we're just starting to put our strategies together, and we're trying to marry up uh, their their excitement to participate with what our needs are at this point in time, and uh, divvy up the workload because there's a large workload as far as uh, implementing the strategies, and and frankly, continue to develop the strategies over time. Next slide. This to me is, is really the number one strategy set, investing in information and public understanding. If the public doesn't understand what we, if they don't understand the science that we're using, they're never going to understand the policies that we want to implement. They're never going to understand the funding requests that we're going to make as we move forward into adaptation. So this is, Bert, this is just key. Again, uh, public understanding of science and what we're doing is going to go a long, long way to the, towards the success of our plans. Next slide. <clears throat> Expanding resilience funding and financing. What we have to do here is refocus the state from depending on just federal dollars or state dollars uh, and, and local dollars, frankly. We need to look beyond that. Um, this is where I usually bring up the idea that uh, the people that incur, the, that, that have, they get the benefits from where they live, uh, may have to start participating uh, in, in uh, the, the cost burden of minimizing the risks. Uh, in other words, if you're going to live at the shore, it's great, uh, but you have to you're going to have to start working with municipalities in order to uh, make sure there's sufficient funding to to provide whatever you're going to do protection adaptation. Um, we're also looking at the idea of of uh, public private partnerships. I will say that I have not seen locally or in the state uh, a lot of public-private partnerships for flood projects in the past or coastal protection projects. This is gonna, it's very popular to say public-private partnerships, but um, getting them to exist, getting them to work is, is another thing that uh, we are actually you know, exploring, looking for examples, looking for models around the country. Um, but anyway, it's going to have to be in our lexicon and we're going to have to get them set up. Next slide. All right. So we are currently working on modifying our land use management regulations. Uh, again, we want to help, we want to help people build in the right places and in the right ways. Uh, this is going to be a key part of the Coastal Resilience Plan. Um, we want to, of course, focus on what sea level rise is going to be in 2050 and 2100 uh, and use those projections in order to uh, guide our actions and the actions of the municipalities and the counties when they do their regional planning. Now, I say regional planning, and I'll, I'll put in a plug here. We have a program called New Jersey. Uh, NJ, Resilience NJ, excuse me, uh, whereby we are working with four sets of municipalities. And there's about, in each set, there's probably four to five municipalities around the state along the coastal area 
where we're trying to help those municipalities put together regional plans. We've hired engineering firms, consulting firms to work with them. And uh, so the, the state is not just going to provide a plan and say, here you go. <clears throat> what we're going to be doing is uh, encouraging, assisting the development of local plans that will fit in with the larger coastal resilience plan. Next slide. There may not be one. I think that's it. There you go. Yeah, Dave, really great job. Great job. Lot, lots of stuff there um, to look at. And I think uh, we could go on for a long time picking at that. Um, Kelly, do we have any questions in the queue for Dave? We do. Um, so there is the question. Um, I've heard a lot about the governor and New Jersey speaking on jobs in the blue and green economy. How will New Jersey create these jobs, like in solar and wind energy, um, ecosystem restoration, creating living shorelines, dune rebuilding, et cetera, so New Jerseyans can get to work on resilience? So you're, you're asking me to stretch outside my field a little bit, but I would say that this is where the, the private sector response to the adapta adaptation plans that we develop or to the greenhouse gas emission plans, or even the uh, energy master plan, whereby we're looking to uh, look at renew, we're looking to convert to renewable energy. Uh, this is where the private sector is going to have to play a major role, and and uh, that's where the jobs will be, of course. Yeah, well, that's great, and, and Dave, I would say that's uh, that question could be a whole nother conference we could put together. Well, thank you very much. And Dave's going to hang around for questions at the end. But what I'd like to do now to stay uh, on time is to move to our final panelist today, um, who is Ann Phillips, who is the Special Assistant to the Governor of Virginia for Coastal Adaptation and Protection. And uh, most of you probably know Ann. She's a real leader throughout the country. And you can hear her or read about her uh, work on any given day in a variety of media outlets. I don't think there's a day goes by I'm not driving home and she's not on either the radio or or something somebody's interviewing her. So um, in Charleston, uh, we are following closely the work that's going on in Virginia and Norfolk and um, particularly uh, the Tidewater area. We're fortunate to be able to learn from a city in a region with similar geography and challenges and Anne's influence has been key to their progress. Anne has been a real leader in this field and it's great to get to hear her perspective. So Anne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you very much for that kind invitation. I'm also gonna turn off my camera because my signal has been really poor today. So if you'll tolerate that, uh, hopefully that will keep me, uh, at least you'll be able to hear me, which might be better anyway. So. Um, first, thanks to the uh, Southeastern Caribbean Disaster Response Partnership for the opportunity to speak with you all today, uh, Dr. Bischoff, and, and to, to appear with my fellow panelists, Charles Sutcliffe and Dave Rosenblatt. I had an opportunity. Uh, I always learn so much every time I hear them, and what I'm looking for are things that you know they are doing, that lessons that they've learned that Virginia needs to learn. And I'm also heartened when I pick up a tidbit that you know, we know we need to do, it, it kind of gives me some confidence that we're moving in the right direction, even if we haven't gotten there just yet. Um, I'd also like to thank Mark for moderating this panel and Elizabeth Fly for, for moderating this panel and then for my, my colleague and, and fellow Norfolk resident Skip Stiles, who's also on the call, who helped us put this, put this panel together. So um, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, what we're doing in the Commonwealth of Virginia to build coastal resilience. You might have noted that I am not the Chief Resilience Officer for the Commonwealth. I am the Special Assistant for Coastal Adaptation and Protection, a position created by the 2018 General Assembly and placed in code in the Commonwealth, largely intended to focus on economic development and the economic development opportunities that will come with adapting and protecting our coast. Uh, the challenge is before we get to that part, um, if and when we get to that part, we, we need to have a plan. And, and we didn't have a plan 
but we're moving in that direction. Um, there is a chief resilience officer. It's currently the Secretary of Natural Resources, Secretary Matt Strickler. Uh, however, that position has kind of bounced around. It was uh, in the previous administration under Governor McAuliffe. It was uh, the uh, Secretary of Public Safety and Homeland Security. And um, it was not in code until the past General Assembly session, 2020 General Assembly session. So uh, we're now trying to do a little more to codify that position. And as uh, both of my fellow panelists have discussed, you know, where should that reside? How should it be structured? Uh, what should it be focused on for the Commonwealth? All are questions that we are wrestling with and, um, and still must decide here in Virginia. So, uh, but in my case, I'm, I'm here to focus on coastal adaptation and protection. And I'm working with all the uh, planning districts east of I-95. We'll get to that in, in a few minutes. Um, at very low, uh, uh, you've seen a couple of sl slides that show science in, in the other two presentations, and I, I didn't bring those today, but I'll, I'll go over some of that briefly. Um, we've seen 18 inches of relative sea level rise in the past 100 years. We expect another 18 inches by 2050. Uh, we are also sinking. We have a land subsidence problem. Um, largely focused in southeastern Virginia, so the Hampton Roads region, and to some extent, eastern shore and middle peninsula, northern neck areas, um, which are also the most vulnerable areas in the Commonwealth. Um, and, and so that's kind of a double whammy. We have water rising and land sinking. It's uh, not consistent across the region, largely caused by aquifer depletion, but we also have glacial isostatic adjustment. There's a meteor crater just north of the Hampton Roads area, recently discovered in the last 25 years that also has some impaction problems and challenges. Um, and so we have, uh, we have quite a bit on our plate here, just in understanding the science alone. We're also experiencing increased rainfall intensity, duration, and frequency. Uh, and we estimate that our current Atlas 14 volume, which is 16, 18 years old, is about 20% uh, low in its uh, estimates of the actual rainfall that we're seeing. So it's uh, we're seeing 20% more rainfall when we get an intense storm than it would project we would see. You're looking at the community of Chesterfield Heights in the city of Norfolk. It is uh, the recipient of a National Disaster Response Competition Grant Award in 2016. Uh, a modest community, middle income, minority, uh, hemmed in by concrete plants on each end and uh, a highway to the north, which you can't see, and the eastern branch of the Elizabeth River, which you do see there to the south. Uh, the National Disaster Response Competition Grant Award for the Commonwealth, which largely went to fund the work that you can see going on in this community, is $110 million, and 10 million of it roughly 10 million, uh, went to set up a, a, an entity called Rise Resilient Solutions, which is to be an incubator for resilient solutions and, and business opportunities, new business opportunities, creative business opportunities to help solve some of the challenges that we have here in coastal Virginia with the idea that they would also be things that would, would help other communities and other locations around the country. So, um, but this is just one small community in one city and in one planning district in coastal Virginia. And the other piece I would say that you're looking at behind you, you can see how flat the topography is. And you're also looking at, but you probably don't realize it, a substantial part of the military ship repair uh, industry in the Commonwealth of Virginia, which is all resident here in the Hampton Roads region, ship construction and repair, I should say, and uh, major medical center, Portsmouth Naval Medical Center, Navy's, Navy's largest, um, one of the latest Navy's largest East Coast medical facilities is here in Hampton Roads. It's in this picture. It's very vulnerable. And Norfolk Naval Shipyard, also lo located just around the corner there, uh, one of four naval shipyards in the country still in service that does nuclear repair work. So we have a lot of stuff here that's particularly vulnerable, and we have some big challenges ahead. Next slide. I keep thinking I'm changing them myself, so my apologies there. So over the course of the past uh, two years, two and a half years, um, the Commonwealth has worked through a series of executive orders signed by Governor Ralph Northam to get us on a path of, of really considering how we will adapt and protect our coast. Um, we were directed to create a master plan by Executive Order 24, which was signed in November of 2018, right after I, I came on board, um, and also to set planning standards for state-owned buildings in the Commonwealth and elevation standards for future construction for state-owned buildings. 
Those two standards were set by Executive Order 45, which was signed a year later, November 2019. We're working off NOAA's 2017 intermediate high projection as our current intended planning standard. I think we thought we were way out there and being very risk averse when we picked that curve, but uh, we do have an accelerating sea level rise challenge here. And at the moment we're more or less on it. So maybe we didn't go far enough, but we'll see in a few years. And if we need to reevaluate, we will. Um, the next iteration signed out October 22nd of 2020 was this master planning framework document. This is the cover page um, that uh, will basically establishes how we will move forward to create a master plan process. One of the challenges within the Commonwealth is um, we like to assign opportunities to do things, but but we typically don't assign any money or staff to go along with them. And that would be true in my case. Uh, next slide. And so it's taken us a while to be able to move forward uh, because we were unable to bring any funding to the table to help localities and to start to build capacity. That changed with the 2020 General Assembly session. As I mentioned, the uh, Chief Resilience Officer position was created and put in code. There were additional authorities given to my position and we expanded the capacity of the Department of Conservation and Recreation's Flood Protection Program, which of course is looking statewide at flood protection. Most significantly, uh, Virginia, who has through the McAuliffe administration and beyond, um, and really preceding that through Governor Kane's administration with a, with a short a four year stint in the middle when Governor McConnell stopped everything. Uh, his administration was not interested in climate or climate related activities. Um, We've been focused on energy for a while. We're also very focused, as you are aware, on Chesapeake Bay water quality compliance, but there's a gap in the middle and the gap in the middle is water management. That's where we come in, that's where I come in. So House Bill 981 uh, authorized Virginia to join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, the 11th state, uh, all Northeastern states, um, which we joined January 1st of this year. The first auction that we will receive carbon credit uh, income from from the sale of carbon credits uh, will take place March 3rd, and that will fund two things. It will fund an energy efficiency fund, which will be run by the Department of Housing and Community Development, and it will fund a, coast, a community flood preparedness fund, not a coastal flood preparedness fund. We had one of those, it never had any money in it. Um, a community flood preparedness fund, 45% uh, of the revenues will go into that fund, which will fund uh, flood resilience initiatives statewide. So we are in the process of writing principles and guidelines for both of those funds. DHGD is working on theirs, DCR is working on the uh, Virginia Community Flood Preparedness Fund. And if you're wondering about the last 5%, 3% goes to the Department of Environmental Quality to manage the REGI participation and program, and 2% goes to DHCD to affect staff the, the needs that they will have for their fund uh, management and uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation is allowed to work with our Virginia Resources Authority who will hold the Virginia Community Flood Preparedness Fund monies and hire sufficient staff to help manage that part of the fund uh, through VRA. So, uh, so without that, um, we would still be struggling to kind of to find a way to move forward. Um, but with it, we and we're doing something unusual, not putting all of this money into energy efficiency, which most other states do. But we now see a path to start to build capacity, uh, particularly for uh, low income and marginalized communities who have both needs. They need the energy efficiency support, but they also need uh, flood protection and awareness. A um, couple of other pieces of legislation here. We did uh, open the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act in Virginia through House Bill 504 to include coastal resilience and adaptation to sea level rise and climate change. In 2020, the work to include that is in regulatory processes is ongoing. DEQ is as through environmental justice initiatives now must address climate change across all its programs and permitting processes. We have not yet driven that into all agencies. Legislation to that effect hasn't hasn't quite made it across the line yet. Um, and then uh, Senate Bill 776. Um, Titan strengthens the living shoreline uh, initiatives that were already in place in the Commonwealth, but uh, unless science uh, through the Virginia Institute of Marine Science Review and others shows that our living shoreline is not suitable. So, and lastly, we have another study going on um, through the uh, overseen by the Virginia Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, to pull together a, an understanding of economic consequences on weather related events, particularly related to the coast. So all of this change with a
2020 General Assembly session, and it's with much of this work that we're able to finally move forward. So next slide. I should also say that the Community Flood Preparedness Fund has a 25% set aside for low income communities uh, defined as being part of a designated opportunity zone or a community or locality 80, with with a locality within a, a or community within a locality or a locality whose uh, median income is 80% of the uh, average in that region so or in that area so um, that'll it will be interesting to see how we work through that as we develop our principles and guidelines uh, I've had localities tell me they think it should be higher so um, so we're just at the beginning stages here but but we have an opportunity I think to really improve equity which is one of our key principles and, and focus areas as we work through this planning process. Um, these are kind of our principles overall. First, acknowledge climate change as being real and base decisions on the best available science. Um, like my fellow panelists, we have excellent universities here within the Commonwealth. Uh, they are all independently funded, which makes working with them um, challenging because uh, if, if you you need to be able to pay them. Um, we do have a Commonwealth Center for Recurrent Flooding Resilience, which pulls together Old Dominion University, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and the Virginia Coastal Policy Center, uh, which is at, for William & Mary Law School. Uh, we'd like to expand that, but if we want to expand it, we have to include the funding to go with it to fund other university participation. So uh, we're making our way in, in that direction, and, and you'll see how we're going to try to generate some more action in this regard as we move forward. We are also focused on natural nature-based solutions as the first line of defense uh, while recognizing of course that there will be solutions that are not nature-based and and gray infrastructure will be required to protect some of the substantial um, federal infrastructure here um, DOD Coast Guard um, and other uh, activities we, it's the only place that we build aircraft carriers in the country is Huntington Ingalls private shipyard Newport News Virginia um, by design by nature of course it's it's vulnerable so we'll have to have a mix but um, we would like to focus on green wherever we can, um, not only as a first line of defense, but also because it's overall it's less costly, at least initially. Uh, we're looking at a region specific approach because actions that are suitable for a place like Hampton Roads, which is very urban, suburban, industrial, are not suitable for the Middle Peninsula, very rural uh, and largely privately owned shoreline, uh, which is true across the Commonwealth. And then as, as we've discussed in the other presentations, how do we determine cost effective solutions? How do we determine cost benefit? How do we pull in federal grant opportunities and align them so that we're focusing them on areas where we have the greatest need and not leaving it up to chance and those who have capacity to apply for them and those who don't don't get anything um, so we've just started that journey but um, we're, we're finally I think starting to have a capacity to start to make some progress there next slide please um, we have four master planning regions that we've broken ourselves down into. We will ultimately have to go into subregions and watersheds. We know that, but we just tried to pull together planning districts that had things in common. And uh, as I've said before, Hampton Roads and the rural coastal Virginia planning districts will be the most impacted by sea level rise the soonest, um, although others are also experiencing some impacts and and, and rainfall in the, the challenge of understanding the impact of this increased rainfall intensity duration and frequency you know over top of nuisance flooding over top of sea level rise over top of minor coastal storms or major coastal storms is is one of our challenges um, next slide please i've talked about some of these already primary goals of course incorporating climate change across state programs and within the actions of state agencies it will take us time to get there we're moving in that direction, but it, again, it, it will take time. Coordinating efforts of, of federal, state, and local authorities. Uh, Virginia does not have a planning capacity at the state level. We've pushed all of our planning to the localities. We are a strict Dillon Rule state. Uh, cities are not in counties. Uh, Louisiana is the state that's the closest to us, but my understanding is they're a hybrid, some home rule, some Dillon Rule. We're strict Dillon Rule, small g government. Um, and we have this unique circumstance of, of an independent city. Um, there are 31 in the country and 28 in the Commonwealth of Virginia, which means that we have places like Virginia Beach and Norfolk and Chesapeake and Portsmouth that are all right next to each other, but all responsible within their boundaries for their own destiny and supported largely by the tax revenue and in particular property tax revenue uh, that they generate within their own boundaries. So that does not lead to coordination. That leads to stovepiped efforts. And uh, this particular challenge 
will impact all of us in a way that uh, is the opposite. You know, we, 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 we can't rely on political boundaries to make the decisions and determine the solutions that we will need to, to deal with this problem. So we have a governmental structure that wants everything to be stovepiped, and, and yet we have this threat that where we must come together. So we feel that the state is the overseer there, and um, now we have an opportunity to try to pull everyone together through identifying and prioritizing projects and then developing, as we've discussed, a, a financial strategy. Next slide. So over the course of uh, the past few months since we released the framework, um, we have solicited an RFP for engineering services to help us do some of this work. We've looked at what Louisiana has done, what Texas has done, what South Florida has done, uh, what all of our, you know, Rhode Island and our and our fellow states to the to the north, um, and of course what South Carolina is is doing too, and and Georgia as well to try to and North Carolina to understand um, what. What we can do to learn from what they've accomplished and to see you know how the things that they've done might work in the commonwealth um, or how we might need to tailor things that they're doing uh, we have established a technical advisory committee to help us oversee this process they have met what's most important about that is that we are bringing in planning districts and outside stakeholders into that process and up until now there really was no way within the commonwealth where that would happen um, the only program that did anything of that nature was our coastal zone management program. Is our coastal zone management program, and um, and that was that was not sufficient. It was focused, you know, focused on a specific set of, of of outcomes and and needs. And so we need to expand that. So now, through Executive Order 71 signed by the governor in December, uh, the technical advisory committee is stood up. They have met. The planning districts are all a part of it, along with a number of state agencies and other stakeholders. And we're starting the process of, of creating subcommittees there and moving forward. The other piece of this I'll talk about quickly is, you know, we realize, and this is lessons learned from, from seeing what Louisiana has done and other states, that we have got to develop some a robust outreach process that will withstand the test of time and administrations right from the start and and building that is going to be tough tougher in the time of covid but um but it's essential to our being able to include community uh feedback and interests uh in the process as we move forward so um a, a tall order uh, to try to get done here and i should mention our first cut you can see here master plan fall of 2021 i've just described about five years worth of work uh but in virginia we have four-year governors so when Governor Northam leaves, uh, he will not be he will not be reelected. That's it. Um, in theory, you can run for a second term later. So the folks are about to test that theory. It has happened once, but um, so so the administrations end every four years. And yet another uh, challenge in in the way that we move forward. So our goal, like my fellow panelists have described, is how do you institutionalize this? to make sure that it continues past administrations and is not reset by the whims of politics, uh, particularly since it is such a nonpartisan issue, we are all being impacted by this. Um, I spoke about Reggie, we are going to uh, investigate the um, strategic relocation uh, needs and, and we're using LA safe as our example there, but uh, the, the depending on who you talk to and i've been working with localities over the past several months since we released the framework um some of it's when you say those words it's like turning on a switch and the bugs running in all directions um some people want to talk about it other people do not uh what we want to emphasize is we have to start to think about this this is not directive it is not authoritative it is not imminent domain it is whether you want to move six houses across the street or you feel like you need to relocate a village on the eastern shore, what should you be thinking about? How should you plan? What kinds of considerations should be put in place? Other such things have been developed, and, and so we're hoping that within the context of Virginia, law, policy, and other needs, we'll be able to start that dialogue and start that conversation. Next slide, please. I'll move pretty quickly here. I've talked about all of these already, except we have elevated our coastal zone management program so that for matters of coastal adaptation and protection, it does report directly to the Secretary of Natural Resources now, which it did not before. It was buried in the Department of Environmental Quality and, and so that we can also take advantage of the excellent work, relationships, progress that this program has already accomplished within the Commonwealth um, 
I mentioned the Bay program earlier, an interesting nuance to Virginia is we have a lot of water quality focus in the Bay watershed, which is one set of designated areas. We have a coastal zone management program, which is another set of designated areas, but none of them include South Virginia Beach or the strip along the North Carolina border. They're not in the Bay watershed, they're not in the coastal zone, and so they're losing out in a lot of ways. The Community Flood Preparedness Fund will help this, but this plan is for the eight coastal planning districts. So it includes all of those areas, whether they're draining into Albemarle, Pamlico Sound, or whether they're draining into the Chesapeake Bay. And um, the challenge with the Coastal Zone Management Program is it doesn't include the Albemarle, Pamlico Sound group. So next slide, please. Back to the old, the, the original comment about, you know, we have a lot of energy focus, we have a lot of water quality focus, we need the motor management focus now. They go, they go together. Um, I've, everything on this slide you've already seen except our, in theory, we will be redo our plan priorities and processes roughly every five years. Um, that's, you know, different states have done it differently. Texas 2017 had a storm, did it again in 2019. Um, Louisiana is kind of working their way into the five-year process and, and so um, that that is what we we hope to emulate and um, and to institutionalize as we move forward. Next slide, please. This last one is just to talk briefly about some work that has been done for us by the Commonwealth Center of Recurrent Flooding Resilience. I mentioned that we have a subsidence problem and of course we have a sea level rise problem, but we, what that leads to is a nuisance flooding problem. So we have a lot of opportunities to excel with flooding when we have sun possibly driven by wind, lunar tides, could be wind, rain, um, it could be any combination of the above. But we really didn't have any mapping or overlays that showed what the nuisance flooding impact was. And so over the course of last summer, 2020, uh, CCRFR worked with NOAA and put together GIS overlays for our entire coast, showing localities what nuisance flooding was going to do for them or to them based on NOAA's 2017 intermediate high projections um, for the years 2040, 2060, and 2080. So this is 2060 Norfolk Harbor. Um, you can see the fuel farm there, the Navy's fuel farm, 34% of the Navy's fuel on the East Coast goes through that fuel farm. You can see it's kind of vulnerable. Um, and uh, you can also see some of the Port of Virginia facilities. Some of them are also at risk of uh, nuisance flooding and also minor coastal storm, nor'easter type flooding by 2060. So uh, the, the challenge for us here in coastal Virginia is we can't just isolate one thing. We can't just protect the fuel farm. We can't just protect the base. We can't just protect downtown Norfolk. Um, we have to protect the entire community because people live and work and transit all over the region all the time. Uh, so that's our that's our future, um, and that is that's our that's our challenge and and our obligation. Next slide, please. I think this is actually my final slide, um, and I see Mark, so he's he's giving me the the high sign. Um, but our objective is to build capacity, and so as we start developing a planning process and a, and a prioritization process for projects, a a project will be in many cases to build capacity for localities for planning districts across the state that don't have the the opportunity to do for themselves because they have limited staff capacity and options, uh, and and so if we if we don't think about those op those communities, if we don't think th about the equity piece of that, um, we're going to leave people behind, a lot of people, and we're going to find over time that we need those people. So so we're. Um, we're right on the cusp of, of moving forward. We are moving forward. Uh, and we're fortunate to be able to learn from so many other states who are uh, moving forward ahead of us or with us, or in some cases going in slightly different directions. But um, um, it's uh, it will be the challenge of our lifetime. And, and I'm just glad to be a part of the journey. So thank you very much. And thank you. Great presentation. Lots of stuff going on in Virginia. Lots of stuff going on in all of our communities. Kelly, do we have any questions uh, specifically for Ann? Uh, no, we don't. Okay. Great. Well, then what I'd like to do then is go ahead and open it up. If we could get everybody into the screen and go ahead and we'll we'll talk a little bit about, I have some, some questions for everybody. Um, the first one that I'd like to ask is, um, and Dave, uh, you touched on it um, a little bit, but I'd like to hear from everybody. And that's how will each of you address resilience more broadly over time, right? We talked a lot about managing the coast, a lot about flooding, but resilience is a lot more than that. And um, how is your state, the trajectory that you find your state's headed in 
Uh, what do you see as the future? We'll go ahead and start with you, Charles. Uh, sure. So I think, um, you know, we are excited to kind of get these tools that we've been working on uh, finished and start using them with state agencies because we know there are other audiences that are going to need those same kinds of uh, tools and, and, you know, lenses that they can apply to their work. So I'm excited to bring that into, you know, to work with, you know, university systems and, and, and parish leaders and, and, you know, local leaders um, even the private sector. So we don't have we don't have ways to kind of help people integrate all these things. And so we want to start doing that. Um, I think in the near future. We also um, do do want to start, um, you know, evolving in, in, into what, what Ann I think hit up hit on towards the end is just the, how do we build local capacity? How do we kind of get all these things that we've learned and bring it down to the local level so that you know the science is understood the the, the future risks are understood and that and that we're able to compete for some of these federal funding programs frankly that are that are asking us to be able to do jump you know do do things that, that we're not able to do right now across at least at least not in an even way across the board so we really want to be able to you know raise the bar for for all of our our, our municipalities and parishes too dave anything you wanted to add to your presentation or along those lines so um, we we have great, I'm sure the other states have great federal partners in the Army Corps and HUD and, and uh, in FEMA. And uh, I think what will be imperative moving forward is to make sure, for, well, for my case, for New Jersey's case, is that as we create this strategy report in the Coastal Resilience Plan, that the federal agencies that have been our partners understand that we in fact have a plan, that we want to move forward in this way. And we understand that you may want to move forward in this other way. But you know, I just got off the phone today with, with two, two Army Corps districts and we, we were starting that conversation. And it, it's, it's exciting, it's a challenge, um, but we're going to be working together in a different way. Uh, because again, we're not responding to things that have happened in the past, like storms. We're responding to things that are happening in the future, and uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see how we we uh, keep our relationships going. Excellent, Ann. Do you have something you want to add? Sure. One of our um, so the technical advisory committee has seven subcommittees. One of ours is strengthening federal partnerships. We, um, through in a stovepipe way, you'll be surprised to hear, uh, address, you know, uh, brick grants, build grants. And now there's a new storm act that's going to provide a coastal resilience uh, re re revolving loan fund. It has to be run by the department agency that's doing emergency management. So VM will have to figure out how they're going to do that. Um, and, and yet we have not aligned them. And as Charles referred to, it appears at the federal level that there is interest in aligning them and showing that you have a plan where you can use one to build on another to build on another. We don't have that right now. So um, we are focusing them more on resilience and, and trying to consider you know, what outcomes we want. Um, but I think this technical advisory committee getting everybody in a room together um, and in subcommittees together is, uh, is going to be a new thing. Virginia used to have something called the Council for the Environment 30 years ago that did that. They disestablished it. They turned it into the Department of Environmental Quality. And what went away? The stakeholder engagement and the external engagement with the localities and the planning districts. So 30 years later, <laughs> we're going to get that back, um, at least in some way. Um, the other thing is DOD through the past four years of National Defense Authorization Act and appropriations bills has developed several different new grant programs that can help outside the fence line and started to fund them. Defense Community Infrastructure, Defense Access Roads, Office of Economic Adjustment Grant. There's some new grant programs there uh, in addition to DSIP. Um, and and uh, you know we should be able to take advantage of them too. And other and you know certainly New Jersey has taken care advantage of some of those, and Louisiana should be able to. So how do we align those opportunities? Um, so just bringing all this to the table. Lunch. Yeah, I, th I think Ann correctly and correctly points out that there's just so much going on. There 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 you know uh, FEMA is showing itself to be very progressive 
in 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 feature mitigation work and 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 uh, uh, it's it's as a chief resilience officer it feels sometimes overwhelming you know you don't you can't control everything but you need to know of most of it and in order to uh, accomplish your goals and it's it's daunting yeah so very very quickly let me just ask another question you brought up the the fema word um and and Anne, i think mentioned emergency management can you real quickly each of you describe um how you and your departments of emergency management interact with each other uh, within your various frameworks and, and the resilience planning process, right? I mean, where, where do you all fit in? Where do they fit in with your work? And we'll start with uh, Ann this time. Um, so we work, I work closely with VDEM uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the grant process, uh, which in which they work with housing and community development, so HUD, uh, community development block grants, uh, and the Department of Conservation and, and Recreation on, in the flood context and to build resilience more broadly. Uh, so I'm a part of that process that was fortunate to be invited in early. Um, but we also work with them on things like uh, we, don't, we don't have a full riverine and coastal gauge system in the Commonwealth, and the big river what riverine gauge system we have belongs to VDEM, and it needs to be updated. So um, that's something that we talk about co continuously: is what scientific needs do we have that will help the state and help planning even down to the locality level? This is just one of those things. Um, and what we found is if we can bound together, then we can you know, make the argument at a higher level for why we need these things rather than one agency at a time trying to go after it. So, um, I mean, VDEM is a big piece of, of our support here. And and they, of course, are on the ground dealing with the outcomes of flooding statewide. I mean, right. and, and most of our flooding where we've had significant damage in the past few years has been in the western part of the state, not the coast. So everybody's going to have their little piece of the pie. Dave, how's New Jersey and, and their Department of Emergency Management working together? So our Office of Emergency Management within the state police is on our interagency council and, and uh, one of the 17 agencies. And uh, you may know that OEM is, is the conduit for uh, FEMA's significant cash flow into the state for mitigation work. And, and um, so, they are with us every step of the way as we develop our strategies. And because of the Interagency Council, we're also, it, it, it created a, uh, a better relationship with OEM than we had in the past. Uh, they get to give us ideas that, that to put in the strategy and, and we get to give them ideas as to maybe how to use some of that FEMA funding. And, and uh, so it's been a win-win for us uh, as we've moved into this, uh, you know, uh, meeting the goals of the uh, executive order for climate change. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. And Charles, um, we're on a positive note here, so we're going to finish with you. Well, sure, I'll be positive. I, I think it is super positive. We, you know, we worked hand in hand with with our disaster management folks during during hurricanes a lot. We have good relationships there. Um, moving into this. You know, proactive pre-disaster mitigation space is something that, that we're working on building that partnership and, and thinking about how can we connect connect all these new opportunities to to the long-term challenge. And that's that's as Dave mentioned, that is it's hard to kind of wrap your head around all the different moving pieces that are involved in that and, and kind of understand what the right exact combination of those different triggers are. Um, but we 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 definitely are trying to get there in Louisiana. Well, I just want to say, um, kind of wrapping up here, it's uh, we're approaching the hour of uh, 4 p.m. That what a great panel! I want to thank all of you very, very, very much for your time, your insight, the work you put into the presentations, and taking the time to share all of this with us. I know I certainly learned a lot. I've got a, two pages of notes here that I took, um, so thank you for that. And with that, any final words from any of our panelists before we turn it back over to Liz? Thank you very much. All, all right, Liz, it's all back to you. 
Okay, well, thanks, Mark. Uh, I just want to echo Mark's thanks to our speakers today. Thank you so much. And um, I think there might have been a specific question or two. We'll pass on to specific speakers here since we're running out of time, but uh, we'll pass those on. And uh, thanks, audience, for your participation. And um, thanks, speakers. And we look forward to everyone logging in tomorrow. Have a good evening. Thanks, Liz. Bye, all. Thank you.